all right um hello everybody uh, i am devajyoti i did my phd on protein crystallography from indian institute of technology kharagpur and after did my after i did my phd i joined university of guelph with uh, rod alan rod merrill to work on uh, adb ribosylation ribosylating toxins and then from there i moved to university of alberta to work with professor larry fligel working on sodium protein anti porter and from there i i went to university of leeds to work with lars lars juken and from there i came to india so it's a long way around the world right it's okay so so this the work i'm going to present today is uh, about uh, uh, is one of my side work you can say so i was involved in sodium protonate filters of uh, yeast which is from uh, saccharomyces sagittaria saccharomyces cerevisiae sagittaria saccharomyces pombe and so when i also joined in the in the larry's lab there is also another work going on and uh, ashad one of my colleague was involved in that and he was trying to express that plant sodium protein anti porter in um, that is formed a strain that is devoid of its indigenous sodium protein anti porter so it is a salt sensitive so he tried to express uh, plant sodium protein anti porter into that uh, organism to see whether this is active in yeasts or not so to our uh, fortune that uh, that particular version when expressed in s pombe it was showing some salt tolerance and we also used different uh, constructs different lengths of uh, sos1 and uh, expressed in s pombe and all of them showing are to some extent uh, salt resistivity but having the most of the c time lecture we am going to discuss about sos1 what is that but give you some overall idea what a, what is it so it has a big c terminal tail and n terminal domain which is the uh, transmembrane domain so even if we just cut mean most of the c terminal tail which is actually regulatory the protein is still working very uh, faintly working very weakly or but is still working there in s bombay so i took up this sos1 work so because i have a, a lot of work in on protein expression and purification as particularly uh, interested to work on membrane proteins and um, so i took up that project and made by made it so that i can express the why not express that sos1 in uh and then try to purify it did it give us some exposure to the membrane protein expression purification and as well as it will also uh it might add some thing so it might contribute something towards the membrane protein purification so anyway so this is mostly started to ex, uh, to gain more experience of my to have on have more experience on the sodium protein anti porter and the membrane protein okay so uh, larry was very kind enough to support this work and before uh, so i'm going to discuss the content of the uh, content of this paper which is the uh, expression and detergent free purification reconstitution of plant plasma membrane sodium protein anti porter in pk pastries so uh, just give you a little bit of overall view what is sodium protein anti porter sodium protein anti porter is a solid carrier protein of uh, nine family and it takes uh, one sodium out and one proton in but it can be a uh, different ratios of sodium and proton depending on the uh, organism so in case of mammal it or the animal cells they are mostly regulating the ph this is a major job of the sodium protein anti porter on the other hand uh the bacteria and yeast and plant they are mostly uh regulating the sodium concentration inside the cell specifically in plant when the where the sodium is not 
allowed inside the cytoplasm and because the sodium is toxic to the cell so that actually uh, does the work of taking the sodium out from the cell so why sodium protein antiporter because this protein has uh, a very good uh, it's a very promising agent to improve the plant salinity and because of the demand on food so there is an there is an estimation that 70% of uh, uh, food demand will go increase by 2050 and that actually need more uh, need more uh, food to be produced by that time but that is actually challenged by the increasing amount of salinity that is uh, that is coming these days and then engulfing the uh, agricultural lands and so this is the indian perspective there are different places in india they are also losing their lands because of the in increase in salinity purpose so uh, so the major salt that is actually working is a uh, salt uh, sensitivity in plant is the sodium so we can actually improve the salinity as uh, salt tolerance in plant by minimizing the sodium entrance into the cells it can also done by maximizing the sodium influx or can you can do that by compartmentalizing the sodium the major pathway in plant uh, that is dealing with the sodium tolerance is done by sos1 and uh, it is done by the help of calcium signaling so what happens so this is an uh, simplest diagram showing the SOS pathway and it is sensed uh, it is sensing the sodium and the sodium actually causes to change the some actin uh, cytoskeleton of the plant cells and that is due to the osmolarity and it can also sense the pH of the can you see my uh, see my car share in the slide can you see my? Yes, yes, I do. Okay. So this MOCA1 protein actually senses the uh, PA, uh, salt stress and this uh, OCSA1 senses the, the osmolarity. So they are all worked by uh, sensing the structure of the membrane and because the membrane structure is changed, there are some pumps and channels that responsible that actually causes the calcium influx into the cytoplasm that actually binds to SOS3 protein, which is a calmodulin like protein. And that goes and binds to SOS2. This is a serine threonine kinase and that actually phosphorylate SOS1, right? So once it is phosphorylate, it will just take one sodium out and bring one proton in. And the protein gradient is maintained by proton ATPS. Okay, so this is the simplest diagram of the pathway of the uh, SOS, but there is more complicated issues that there, but anyway. So I took that work of expressing the SOS1. So SOS1 is consisting of two domains. One is the transformant domain or the intraminal domain and the big C-terminal domain. So the big C-terminal domain is consisting of several subdomains, the, the remote C terminal domain, remotest C terminal domain is the inhibitory domain, auto inhibitory domain that actually goes undergoes the phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. So once it is phosphorylated, the protein is active and working as a sodium protein antiporter. Once it is dephosphorylated, this protein is stopped working. So to express this particular protein, I uh, took two, diff three different constructs. To, uh, so the first construct is having the N-terminal domain, which is a membrane domain, entire membrane domain, and little bit of C-terminal domain. And the second construct is having most of the C-terminal domain. And the third construct is having the entire C-terminal domain. So I first tried to clone that and, and express the protein from starting from one amino acid, but unfortunately, none of them expressed because I think there are some low complexity region at the N-terminal and that is actually extracellular. So when I truncated that region uh, and tried to express, it started expressing. So I started expressing at 28 amino acid. 
So these proteins are cloned in the big pigs that are vector. So this is a whole, uh, this is a vector modified uh, in Professor Joanne Lemieux's lab in University of Alberta, and uh, this was further modified to accommodate uh, constructs. And at the end of its production, the protein will be expressed like this construct. So it has a tape site and followed by the GFP, followed by the his tag. Right. So I'll be dealing with most to the, uh, these two construct, which is the 460 and 990. So this is the uh, nomenclature I have used throughout the slide. Now, uh, there is a protocol uh, already established in Lemieux's lab. I just followed to express that particular uh, constructs in, uh, in the EPK pastries. So, uh, the methanol expressed in uh, there done in the BMMY media and the uh, cells are harvested, uh, isolated the membranes, uh, and then uh, it was tried to dissolve at one molar DDM. So why DDM? I tried uh, two or three different uh, uh, detergents. Those are actually available at that point, uh, in including the octal glucoside and other things. So, but the DDM worked best for the solubilizing this protein, uh, isolated mem from the membrane. And uh, one person did it was good enough to do it. And nickel NT was done. The protein was diluted at 300 millimolar of imidazole. Then I did the tape cleavage and run the second uh, round of uh, uh, nickel NT column and reduce the DDM concentration to 0.1%. And uh, yeah, so this is the result of, so before going to that, there are three notes I want to uh, I want to mention. The first one is the PTA was cultured at 28 degree. And uh, I used an antifoam in my culture. The third one is that uh, we maintained to maintain the pH to uh, 5.9 to 6.2 using the phosphoric acid and KOH. So these are the major key things I uh, established for expressing this protein. And for the cell disruption, I use the three cycles of freeze thaw followed by three sonication cycles. Okay, so uh, this particular uh, gel is showing that the protein is quite uh, almost pure at the end of the purification of the first nickel and chromatography and it was the tape cleavage was done of this protein and this particular tape is also having the uh, history intact so i run the second nickel in tea chromatography fall and that actually in the flow through i collected the protein uh, this particular protein is not very stable at the end of the process and uh, if i even if i aliquot it and uh, quickly freeze it and keep it in the minus uh, minus 80 after I check out the next time. So it was almost showing all kind of, uh, so no, there is no clear band. So it's kind of diffuse band. So, and all degradations are ever there. So the protein is not very stable. Then yield is also not very reproducible. So okay, try, I tried different, uh, different amount of uh, culture and uh, try to keep it as accurate as possible. So, but anyway, at the end of the process, the yield is not very uh, reproducible. So this is the initial thing I did with the DDM. And uh, then uh, something happened actually, it was very interesting and uh, actually uh, very funny also. In University of Alberta, we have a membrane protein disease research group. And we also have a journal club there. So my first journal presentation I uh, did with this particular uh, PNS paper, which was almost uh, in 2014, I think it was released. Uh, by Anthony Killian was there. Uh, Timothy Dufferin was also there in this paper. So they tried uh, to express the uh, E. coli KCSA and then try to reconstitute into the lipid, uh, planar lipid bilayer. 
And uh, so this figure I, I just made for, for the sake of that presentation in general sub. And I was quite fascinated by using this detergent free isolation method. And, uh, and I, I hoped at that time I was just purifying that uh, SOS1 using the DDM. I hoped maybe I can use this uh, particular detergent free isolation method. And uh, when during the question and answer session, someone, one student, I, I think it was Garrett. Garrett asked me that uh, whether uh, we are, uh, there is some question he was, he was asking me. And uh, Larry then replied that uh, Michael Overdoing, who work, work on this uh, detergent-free method, is going to join our department. So I was kind of uh, surprised. So anyway, so I do not know that uh, somebody is over there on the top and listen to your prey very quick, so quickly. So anyway, so as I was very, very happy to hear that, but at that time, I didn't realize uh, the pleasure of working with the uh, detergent free method. So anyway, I just uh, working, I started concentrating with my other work. And uh, by that time, uh, Michael joined. And uh, fortunately, he was actually our uh, neighbor, the next door neighbor. So what, it, what better it can be. So I told Larry and Larry was very happy so that we can collaborate with Michael and then uh, we can get some SMAs from him. So I tried using that SMA. So, and I also learned that how the detergents at that time. So this is my learning process. I never had worked with uh, membrane protein before. So, uh, so it may be a little bit layman style. So please excuse me. So detergent micellis can be used uh, for expressing and dissolving, solubilizing the membrane proteins. It just, uh, does the long hydrophobic regions actually uh, cover up the hydrophobic patches of the membrane, making it soluble. The, we can also use the phospholipid bacillus. There are two different components uh, of different, uh, uh, different shape can be used to dissolving, uh, solubilizing the membrane protein. You can also use the interlamellar vesicles where keeping some aqueous phase inside the small container, a spherical shape thing. And then we can always use the nanodics, which is also very fascinating to use and uh, devised uh, in, uh, like introduced by Stephen Slinger. But uh, doing this, there are several limitations. Uh, I realized that uh, there are many detergents available and uh, then they, we have to, we can just uh, look for and screen, screen for the right detergent that is suitable for our membrane protein. So that is a kind of tedious. Although DDM is very, very popular and now there is the uh, NMPG, I think new pen uh, I forget the whole name. That is also very getting very popular these days to treat and solubilizing the membrane proteins. But anyway, but the list is very long. So there is a plenty of work one might have to do for choosing their exact detergent. Second is that the detergent does not mimic the protein native environment. So that is one so uh, concerning thing. The second part, third one is that uh, you can use the nanotics, which is a very nice idea, but even there, we have to solubilize our protein, membrane protein within some detergent. And then from their detergent, you can then reconstitute them in the nanodisc. The fourth one is that the nanodisc is also having some apolipoprotein. So that can also, uh, that can also interfere with the signals coming from the protein. Okay, so keeping this in mind, I tried to uh, start my work with SMA. And as you all know that this particular SMA is the styrene uh, myric acid polymer, it has a different versions. So the best thing is that it is cost effective. So as I said that it, this is my side work and I was very curious to do and passionate to do work on this, but we have do not have a plenty of money. And this is, uh, so therefore it is the best thing I, I can hope for the cost effective. The another thing I did not mention, the easy availability. 
So what better option it can be when your uh, neighbor is making the SNA polymer for you. Anyway, so that is the second thing. The third and fourth is the isolation, letting it let, let you isolate the your protein, membrane protein in its native environment. And that actually enhances stability and because it is in the native environment. And if you are lucky enough, you can also detect the some membrane protein, membrane protein interaction because it is staying in the native environment. I think there is, I have also seen one PNS paper where the GPCR they have worked on and they found some protein protein interactions there. But there, I, I'm sure there are plenty of examples uh, floating around. So the, it also let you identify the, um, uh, identify the membrane protein preferred lipids, which is also very astonishing because the membrane proteins are not working alone. They have their companions around them. Uh, there are some cons, uh, which is the pH range, but the pH range, this is the pH range people usually, wa use, usually use for the protein purification. So most of the cases, it should not be a problem. But there are now available the different versions of SMAs. Those are uh, enable those can enable you to. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, sure. I'll just try to wrap up. Just twenty minutes. So enable you to do uh, the purification at dif at a, mm, a different pH other than this one. It has also some uh, twenty uh, limited disk size. And, but it also have some sensitivity towards divalent cation, but it can also be used some uh, good purpose using this divalent cation. I will see, I will show you what I use. So some inspiration, uh, this is the John Rubinstein uh, tweeting the first SM small protein structure. And this is the Jenna Broker and Oliver Ernest's uh, paper in uh, structure of, um, I am sure you all know this is from Joachim Frank's lab and uh, collaborated with another scientist in Colombia. Uh, they are uh, getting the structure in SCRP in the native environment. So we got some uh, sources of SMA 2000 from Michael. And then I thank to Mansoor that he, she was also helping, giving me some uh, initial idea and working procedures with SMA. So SMA is also, purification is also done the same way. The major thing here, I came up with SMA 2000 and uh, the concentration of weight by volume is 2.5%. I found it as the most effective uh, concentration I can go. And I also tried other SMAs, but uh, SMA 2000 worked uh, better for me. So after isolating the Membrane suspension, I added the drop wise and then keep it uh, shaking at the room temperature for three hours. Then overnight incubation is done with the nickel and tear beads. So initially I tried to, uh, after isolate uh, incubation, we tried to collect the um, supernatant and load it in the nickel and tear column, but that actually gave me not very much binding uh, to the column, but overnight incubation worked very well for me. So this is the uh, 460 version and uh, I kept the EGFP for a purpose to see that whether our protein is getting, uh, where, where protein is getting targeted, whether it is coming along uh, any, any particular places. So I did not purposefully keep the EGFP. So the thing is that the major contaminant I suffered with the alcohol oxidase which is actually very recalcitrant and stays all along the purification process, even at the end of the purification process. But the concentration of alcohol oxidase can be reduced if I just do the washing with the, uh, for longer time with the resuspension buffer. The same thing is happening here for the bigger version. But one interesting thing I just want to note here, uh, when, I when I just cut these bands and send the bands for the angel uh, analysis in the mask. And then I found that, that there is also proton ATPs that is coming out of the purification and it actually stays there. So this is the uh, yeast uh, plasma membrane proton ATPs. 
so i further proceed to purify and understand what is the uh, quaternary structure of this protein what is the quaternary state of this protein so based on the um, uh, calibration curve i found that uh, the sos 990 the bigger one is actually present as a dimer or monomer and it is contaminated with the uh, tetramer of alcohol oxidase and alcohol oxidase of monomer. So the tetramer of alcohol oxidase and alcohol oxidase actually can stay in different quaternary states. In this case, I'm getting the tetramer and monomer all the way. Uh, on the other hand, the smaller version, which is a 460, is predominantly existing as dimer. And uh, that has a major difference between these two uh, SOS 990. Okay, so the first conclusion, uh, I just want to draw the conclusion as SOS 990 is existing as dimer and monomer, so it is in equilibrium. And SOS 460 is predominantly as a dimer. So I hope, I think this is because of the long C terminal tail that is actually uh, also interacting with the uh, lipid membrane. So that might be the cause that might cause the increase in the disk size and therefore SM is not uh, that much efficient of covering the entire disks. And the interesting fact is that the proton ATPase also have, we got some uh, like uh, proton ATPase coming all the way of the purification. So it, it may be an artifact, but I, strongly believe this, this is not because the protein ATPase and sodium protein antiporter is actually interacting. Although it is a plant protein, there are some conserved domains of sodium protein antiporters that might interact. Uh, uh, There's a conserved domain with the yeast one that might interact the yeast uh, protein, anti, uh, protein ATPase. So the reconstitution to the vesicle. So when I was trying to reconstitute I found this paper came out from Peter, Peter Bezensky's lab. They also did the reconstitution into the vesicles uh, directly from the SMA particles. But my protocol is a uh, small difference is there. Uh, so I prepared the soy selectin vesicles uh, that is having the pyranin or HPTS inside it. And this particular buffer is containing the ammonium chloride. And uh, freshly produced SMB disk was just missed. So the protein lipid ratio was maintained as one is to 100. And then I added the five millimolar magnesium chloride and incubated it 24 hours. So this particular step was not there. And I found in several literature that uh, con having the SMA contamination also does some uh, interference with this activity. So I always wanted to get rid of the SMA before reconstituting into the vesicle. And I did so by adding the magnesium chloride, the divalent cation. Then the precipitated SMA was done by centrifugation. The dialysis was done against the magnesium free buffer, which is also not containing the pyranine. Then the liposomes are collected and used for the uh, transport studies. So these are the different phases of the reconstitution. Um, so this is the final fractions of lip liposome and for the smaller protein. And this is the bigger uh, version of the liposome. So this, this excuse me, this uh, gels because it's having the liposome and lipid content. So it is not very clear. So, but at the end of the day, I was able to very little bit of very a uh, small amount of SOS 990 was reconstituted in the uh, vesicles. Then I did the assay, which is actually by, uh, this actually run by, uh, so ammonium chloride free buffer was used. And because the liposome was prepared ammonia, in presence of ammonium chloride, this particular uh, equilibrium exists. The ammonium will be coming out from the cells, reducing the pH, the pyranine will and that actually give us the sodium protein antiporter activity. Then the gradient was broken by adding the ammonium chloride. So uh, this is the activity of the bigger protein, SOS 992, and it was uh, good active. 
uh, uh, and uh, the smaller version of the protein on the other hand does not show any activity. So this was repeated two times and this was also repeated a couple of times, but we did not see any activity over with the SNAP460. So what are the summary? So SOS 460 was 460 and 990 was expressed in PK pastries. The small protein was able to be purified using the DGM. Uh, both proteins are uh, partially purified using SMA 2000 and uh, SOS 460 GFP and both are reconstituted in the proteolyposome using the detergent free method. So, so far uh, it's the work I did and I'm thankful to my supervisor, Larry and Michael. Uh, I really miss the lab. So, and Howard was also there and he helped me a lot. And Joanne was also there and he also helped, she also helped me a lot for the purification purpose. Uh, the Mansoor uh, was, and Grant is now, I think he, he's working with uh, uh, Gunnar Van Haini right now these days um, and uh, thanks to the funding agency IITG and then MPGHG. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions? Thank you so much uh, Deb. So yeah, if uh, anyone has any questions just to speak up, just unmute yourself and I have a couple of questions but uh, I leave it first to other participants. Hi, um, this is Naomi. Is it okay if I Hi. ask? A yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Hi, thanks. Um, I was just wondering about some of the details of the purification um, and the mm -hmm. contaminants that you found with SMA because we um, we often see really kind of persistent contaminants. So if it's E. coli, it's just a subset of proteins that always stick. And I wondered right. if you have any hypothesis about why the AOX in particular. Um, uh, mm -hmm. persists in your purification if there's a potential binding site or it's really abundant that sort of thing i so uh, this pk expression is actually uh, happening because of the methanol uh, induction right so and the methanol works by using the aox under aox promoter so alcohol oxidase is plentiful so i don't think this there this is this is any uh, sensible interaction between the SOS1 and AOX, but it may be due to, and alcohol oxidase also has some affinity towards the membrane. Very tiny affinity, but it also uh, has some affinity, so if I remember. So it may be some artifact that is coming with, in this case. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Deb, you mentioned that you tried other types of polymers, like SMA. You mentioned only SMA two thousand, but uh, what were the other polymers that you tried, and you were happier with SMA two thousand? Why is that? So SM, I tried uh, uh, SMA two five zero one zero from polyester. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, I did not uh, uh, did not get any better uh, solubilization. Uh, so therefore, I stick to SMA two thousand. Did you use the same concentration, like two point five percent? I tried all the different concentration and two point five percent too. Oh, even for two the twenty five or ten, you got this uh, not a good level of uh, uh, purification. Uh, no. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So I got a question from Vishnu. Uh, he asking that uh, did you try an alternative expression system? No, I didn't try any alternative system because uh, as I, it is my side work and uh, I got it uh, because it's expressing. So unfortunately I didn't have a chance to go for any other system. Of course I had, uh, at that time we had a uh, uh, saccharomyces, any other, yeah, other systems too, but uh, no, I didn't try. Could you go back to your previous slide that you show the activity of two different isoforms, not isoform, two different uh, constructs? Yes. Constructs. Yeah. 
why you didn't see any activity for the one on yeah for uh, SOS uh, 460 EGFP? Why is that? Did you troubleshoot or did you did you figure out? Do you have any? Is that because of SMA or is that because of the construct itself? I personally believe uh, it is because of the construct. So uh, the thing is that there is a very major difference between the plant sodium proton antiporter and the yeast sodium proton antiporter. So the yeast sodium proton antiporter has uh, many of these sodium and sodium proton antiporter does not have a large C-terminal gel. So it's very tiny. So, and it is very active. It does not, uh, there is very less regulation in case of yeast one. But in case of plant, the C-terminal is actually very important. And there are many proteins binding and unbinding with this C-terminal gel. So the, I think that uh, C-terminal also have some uh, uh, participation in the structure because there is a very low resolution structure present of SOS1, which is the same Spain's group, uh, Spain, Spanish group you are talking about. Mm -hmm. So they did a 25 angstrom structure and it was showing that the C-terminal is actually tightly packed with the membrane domain. So I believe this is because of the C-terminal is active and uh, not present. So you did the transfer activity in the presence of detergent for this construct and you didn't get the same, you didn't get any like activity, right? With the detergent, yes. I also did with the detergent. So and did I did okay. okay. So I'm not sure about other uh, people's uh, opinion, but I believe SMA, uh, price is going up. For example, I double checked on the website. There are some uh, companies selling like one gram of SMA for like one gram, two grams of active SMA for like $250. So in fact, SMA is not cheap. It's not <laughs> cost effective. Okay. Not if you want right. it from a scratch. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a problem. But uh, yeah, that was very nice of the polyscope to uh, provide and free SMA or 25 or 10 and three, I believe you tried 310 as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I think, I think also tried that 300, but I don't remember, but that also, that is also, mm -hmm. that is even worse, I think. Oh, in That's your, in the, okay. yeah, in my construct. I think Dr. Postles has a question. Yeah, yeah. so uh, Riset was saying that, did you try the tape cleavage in small? Uh, like you did in DDM. Uh, I did try after reconstituting. I just want to see that what is the orientation of the protein. But uh, due to the trying constant, I do not have any conclusive uh, part from there. So, sorry, no, sorry if I um, missed this or, or misunderstood it. Did you were you able to reconstitute the protein from detergent into liposomes? Um, or did you just not have enough of it because of the instability? I try. I did uh, reconstitute the uh, from from detergent solubilized SOS 460 to the liposome. Yes. And how did um, how did the yield of that compare with your SMA reconstitution? The yield is very low uh, in case of SMA. So the um, the final content of the protein from the SMA to vesicles and the final content of the protein from DDM to the vesicles is uh, for the SMA, it is very, very low. Yeah, I suppose if you end up with active protein, it's, uh, it's worth it still. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, that's true. But I never tried the bigger, the SOS 990 with the DDM the constitution. I tried purified purification of the SOS 990, but never tried the reconstitution with the DDM. Yeah, but would you like to just make some point about, uh, uh, for example, the size collusion chromatography that you showed, the chromatogram that you showed? Mm -hmm. Did you ever take those fractions and look at them by EM or negative stain? Because Dr. Young's lab were involved partially in this project. So what do you 
yes i think uh, i think uh, 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 i say i gave some samples uh, which is comparatively uh, showing little bit clear in the gel so and uh, but unfortunately when uh, the em strain was collected the image was collected it was not showing very homogeneous solution so i could not proceed with that so do you have any micrographs i have any what do you have any electron micrographs of those uh, particles i have but i do not have it in, in this slide okay right okay so they are very it is, okay. yeah it is not very clear it is very dirty mm -hmm. on the on the chromatogram are the um the peaks labeled 1 and 4 is that the void volume of your column yes 1 and 4 is void volume it's a indicate it looks um it looks really similar to what we see for a lot of size exclusion of a lot comes out in the void volume and then you get these sort of smaller subsequent peaks which have some different um right right. right so the one thing is that that uh, if you take the number 2 fraction and then try to concentrate and reload it in the size exclusion chromatography you will always get at this one so there is an equilibrium between these two i think interesting i i found in the past that there some proteins seem to be in that equilibrium and other proteins if you recover the say the fractions from peak 2 there that they yeah, yeah. that they come back out say at that 50 mil um peak again. So there must be some variability between different proteins as to how stable they are after purification. It's interesting yeah. to see the kind of, I suppose the similarities and um, in the initial traces at least, with yeah. the lots of ones that I've seen. <laughs> yeah, so this is the super dexis 200, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's right. So I suppose for um, electron micrographs, if you're taking, say, peak mm -hmm. two or three, there's probably going to be some of the um, aggregated material still in those fractions because the peaks aren't particularly well resolved. I think that's a, a problem that I've had as well, that okay. the separation by these columns of um, SMALPs is actually not really good enough for what we need, I think, it's a bit of a technical okay. limitation. Uh... Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's true. We, there may be a CSMA conta contamination uh, and also, uh, so these are all in the SMA disks, right? So uh, it is actually the, from the calibration curve, I saw that uh, SAS992 is actually having a dimer and monomer, okay? So they are having two different uh, fractions. Uh, but in case of SAS460, uh, it is mainly a dimer. So Vizet was asking, is it a super, okay, so could it be a dimer at the disk? We had that with some uh, of our protein, it is visible in EM. Yes, so uh, the EM we collected, it's, it was showing, uh, we, we cannot say it is a dimer, but there are some big particles uh, look, uh, looking alike, big particles. Uh, it, 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 we never proceeded in that direction because the purification quality is not that good. So it is possible that it is a dimer present in the disk of SOS 990. But I'm not sure that how good the SMA disks are to hold the, this, big, uh, this big thing, SOS 990. Yeah, but how important is to make a fresh disk, I mean, fresh uh, preparation of disk and then uh, uh, reconstitute into vesicle? How fresh, you said freshly prepared nano disk. So how fresh and why? Because probably you tried other... Uh, okay, so you mean that uh, how fresh this was? So it was next day. So parallelly, I was doing the preparing the vesicles with the purification. Okay, so uh, so once the vesicles are ready, I just uh, probably I just store it one day at uh, in minus eighty and then uh, reconstitute it in the vesicles. It's interesting that you keep your protein and you kept your protein in minus eighty. I would never do that. 
<laughs> so I would, I would definitely keep it in four degree. Is was there any preference? I mean, preference for you that's minus eighty? Oh, uh, as I was afraid. <laughs> But okay. to me, it's four degree. But anyway, uh, it is never more than one day of waiting. Mm -hmm. So Vishal was asking that uh, I am referring to the two discs in contact. Um, yeah, maybe uh, maybe I am not sure what those bigger particles are. We never proceeded that. I'm sorry, I do not have the picture with me right now. But uh, it was really dirty. But but there are some bigger, big particles all over the grids. And, uh, and it was very interesting too, if we could have proceeded that direction. I feel as though we're all asking you lots of uh, really detailed questions, but I just wanted to say that um, during your talk, it was really um, nice to just hear your enthusiasm. It took me back to when I started working on SMALPS and how um, transformational it seemed um, compared yeah. to working with detergents. So, um, right. Yeah, it was really great to hear you talk about this sort of side project and how you were able to make the most of um, just opportunities, I suppose, to to try SMA with something new. And being able to reconstitute it is such a big um, kind of advance yeah. happened recently. It's really um, exciting to think about all the you know, experiments that can be done then with the protein. Right, right. So actually, uh, Larry was a little bit... Uh, restricting me to go it for the publication unless he gets some activity. So, and it was very hard to do this, uh, this much of uh, work keeping our, another paper is going on side by side. So I really had a very busy time before uh, leaving the uh, Alberta. So <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I remember you were working so hard, even weekends. Yeah, <laughs> I remember those days. Um, yeah, do you, if anyone wants to try this type of uh, a small view, suggest or you'd say go ahead with detergents first and see how your protein looks like and then go with a small, I mean, in terms of the uh, struggles you had. No, I will always, I will always suggest cooking the detergents. Uh, although I, uh, did not uh, prefer in my slide, but always have have to have some. I uh, keep the detergent side by side, so that we have a very good comparison uh, of what is actually going on with the small, right? So that is our uh, membrane uh, lipid stripped environment in the detergent, right? And it is our lipid containing environment. So we always have some comparison. It is better to have as much data to have to reach some uh, like idea or hypothesis. Yeah, I know some groups that SMA they, is their last option. For example, oh. they try with detergents and they try with different uh, other like uh, mimetics like MSP, Amphipo. If they don't get a good result, they say, "Okay, we go with the SMA." So that's uh, like. <laughs> Uh, interesting to know for even some groups they prefer MSP nanodisc over small which is unless they want to improve the impact of the papers or they have some question for the liquid environment that's uh, so that they move to SMA and of course the SMA is a very good system but there are still uh, many difficulties uh, uh, with this uh, with this protocol because uh, even uh, SMA can uh, enable you to solubilize your protein, but uh, it is very hard to handle with that, that much lipid, maybe. So, uh, so far I have a very bad time with the preparing the gel, <laughs> as you can see from my mm -hmm. slides. Oh, that's so, <laughs> anyway, so, uh, but anyway, it is very interesting. That's why I am to venture in future, maybe if I had chance to more in with the SMS because the lipids, I'm very curious about the lipids what are interacting with our membrane protein. That is very fascinating actually, yeah. yeah. Another thing that I learned, you know, uh, it's, it's good to talk to other scientists. 
uh, what I learned is some people are interested in you know, like uh, finding the structure of partners, I mean, uh, proteins that are interacting with your main protein, like alkaline uh, phosphatase, you said? That is mm -hmm. the, the protein that... The protein that yeah, that uh, protein interaction, I mean, is like a stable interaction with your psoas uh, protein. So a lot of people consider it as like metabolone. So they mm -hmm. try to just get the metabolone and get the structure mm -hmm. of, you know, mm -hmm. the structure. So yeah, that, that is also another thing about a small, in, if, you, if they use MSP, probably uh, that is not feasible or doable. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That is the, another good aspect of the SMA. You can catch some protein-protein uh, interactions in there. Like I, I did, I, I'm, I'm sure, very much sure, this is not uh, any artifact, but uh, this proton ATPase that is coming with the uh, SOS1 is very interesting, right? So uh, if it is, it can be extended that the protein ATPase combined with the SOS structure can be determined or the, uh, uh, yeah, the yeast sodium protein antipoter along with the protein ATPase, how does that two protein interacts? So that is also very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think those aspects that lipid um, contacts and the protein-protein interactions, are, mm -hmm. that's the thing that I still find most fascinating about um, SMA. In some ways, it's like harder things to actually um, yeah. to investigate, but I think that's where a lot of the value will be. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Excellent. So, is there any other questions for Deb? Thank you all.